This is taken from my weekly podcast called Down to Sleep, where I softly read books to you to help you get a good night's rest. This is a version for YouTube with relaxing rain sounds with it. If you want to hear it without the rain, you can listen to it on Spotify or other podcast apps. Before I tuck you in, please hit that like button as it helps me know that you enjoy these videos. If you'd like to hear more, all the links that you need are in the description. Enjoy. The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling Mowgli's Brothers It was seven o'clock of a very warm evening in the Sioni Hills when Father Wolf woke up from his day's rest, scratched himself, yawned, and spread out his paws, one after the other to get rid of the sleepy feeling in the tips. Mother Wolf lay with her big grey nose dropped across her four tumbling, squealing cubs, and the moon shone into the mouth of the cave where they all lived. It is time to hunt again, said Father Wolf. He was going to spring downhill when a little shadow with a bushy tail crossed the threshold and whined. Good luck go with you, O chief of the wolves, and good luck, and strong white teeth go with noble children, that they may never forget the hungry in this world. It was the jackal, Tabaki, the dish licker, and the wolves of India despise Tabaki because he runs about making mischief and telling tales, eating rags and pieces of leather from the village rubbish heaps. But they are afraid of him too, because Tabaki, more than anyone else in the jungle, is apt to go mad, and then he forgets that he was ever afraid of anyone, and runs through the forest biting everything in his way. Even the tiger runs and hides when little Tabaki goes mad. For madness is the most disgraceful thing that can overtake a wild creature. We call it hydrophobia. They call it diwani, madness, and run. Enter then and look, said Father Wolf stiffly, but there is no food here. For a wolf, no, said Tabaki. But for so mean a person as myself, a dry bone is a good feast. Who are we, the Gidalog, which means the jackal people? to pick and choose. He scuttled to the back of the cave where he found the bone of a buck with some meat on it, and sat, cracking the end merrily. All thanks for this good meal, he said, licking his lips. How beautiful are the noble children, how large are their eyes, and so young too. Indeed, indeed, I might have remembered that the children of kings are men from the beginning. Now Tabaki knew as well as anyone else that there is nothing so unlucky as to compliment children to their faces. It pleased him to see Mother and Father Wolf look uncomfortable. Tabaki sat still, rejoicing in the mischief he had made, and then he said spitefully, Shere Khan, the big one, has shifted his hunting grounds. He will hunt among these hills for the next moon, so he has told me. Shere Khan was the tiger who lived near the Wanganga River, twenty miles away. He has no right, Father Wolf began angrily. By the law of the jungle, he has no right to change his quarters without due warning. He will frighten every head of game within ten miles, and I have to kill for two these days. His mother did not call him the Lungry, lame one, for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He's been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. Now the villagers of the Wangunga are angry with him, and he has come here to make our villagers angry. They will scour the jungle for him when he is far away and we and our children must run when the grass is set alight. Indeed, we are very grateful to Shere Khan. Shall I tell him of your gratitude? said Tabaki. Out, snapped Father Wolf. Out and hunt with thy master. Thou hast done harm enough for one night. I go, said Tabaki quietly. Ye can hear Shere Khan below in the thickets. I might have saved myself the message. Father Wolf listened and below in the valley that ran down to a little river, he heard a dry, angry, snarly, sing-song whine of a tiger who has caught nothing and does not care. All the jungle knows it. The fool, said Father Wolf, to begin a night's work with that noise. Does he think that our buck are like the fat Wangunga bullocks? It is neither bullock nor buck that he hunts tonight, said Mother Wolf. It is man. The wine had changed to a sort of humming purr that seemed to come from every quarter of the compass. It was the noise that bewilders woodcutters and gypsies sleeping in the open, 
and makes them run sometimes into the very mouth of the tiger. Man, said Father Wolf, showing all of his white teeth. Are there not enough beetles and frogs in the tanks that he must eat man, and on our ground too? The law of the jungle, which never orders anything without a reason, forbids every beast to eat man, except when he is killing to show his children how to kill, and then he must hunt outside the hunting grounds of his pack or tribe. The real reason for this is that man-killing means sooner or later the arrival of white men on elephants with guns, and hundreds of brown men with gongs and rockets and torches, then everybody in the jungle suffers. The reason the beasts give among themselves is that man is the weakest, most defenseless of all living things, and it is unsportsmanlike to touch him. They say too, and it is true, that man-eaters become mangy and lose their teeth. The purr grew louder and ended in a full-throated roar of the tiger's charge. A howl, an untigerish howl from Shere Khan. He's missed, said Mother Wolf. What is it? Father Wolf ran out a few paces and heard Shere Khan muttering and mumbling savagely as he tumbled about in the scrub. The fool has had no more sense than to jump at a woodcutter's fire and burned his feet, said Father Wolf with a grunt. Tabaki is with him. Something is coming uphill, said Mother Wolf, twitching one ear. Get ready. The bushes rustled a little in the thicket, and Father Wolf dropped with his haunches under him, ready for his leap. Then, if you had been watching, you would have seen the most wonderful thing in the world. The wolf checked in mid-spring. He made his bound before he saw what it was he was jumping at, and then he tried to stop himself. The result was that he shot up straight into the air for four or five feet, landing almost where he left ground. Man, he snapped. A man-cub. Look. Directly in front of him, holding on by a low branch, stood a naked brown baby who could just walk, as soft and as dimpled a little atom as ever came to a wolf's cave at night. He looked up into Father Wolf's face and laughed. Is that a man-cub? said Mother Wolf. I've never seen one. Bring it here. A wolf, accustomed to moving his own cubs, can, if necessary, mouth an egg without breaking it. And though Father Wolf's jaws closed right on the child's back, not a tooth even scratched the skin as he laid it down among the cubs. How little, how naked, how bold, said Mother softly. The baby was pushing his way between the cubs to get close to the warm hide. He is taking his meal with the others. So this is a man's cub. Now, is there ever a wolf that could boast of a man cub among her children? I have heard now and again of such a thing, but never in our pack or in my time, said Father Wolf. He is altogether without hair, and I could kill him with a touch of my foot. But see, he looks up, and is not afraid. The moonlight was blocked out of the mouth of the cave, for Shere Khan's great square head and shoulders were thrust into the entrance. Tabaki behind him squeaking, My lord, my lord, it went in there. Shere Khan does us great honor, said Father Wolf, but his eyes were very angry. What does Shere Khan need? My quarry. A man's cub went this way said Shere Khan. Its parents have run off. Give it to me. Shere Khan had jumped at a woodcutter's fire, as Father Wolf had said, and was furious from the pain of his burned feet. But Father Wolf knew that the mouth of the cave was too narrow for a tiger to come in by. Even where he was, Shere Khan's shoulders and forepaws were cramped for want of room, as a man's would be if he tried to fight in a barrel. The wolves are a free people, said Father Wolf. They take orders from the head of the pack, and not from any striped cattle killer. The man's cub is ours, to kill if we choose. Ye choose, and ye do not choose. What talk is this of choosing by the bull that I killed? Am I to stand nosing into your dog's den for my fair dues? It is I, Sheer Khan, who speaks. The tiger's roar filled the cave with thunder. Mother Wolf shook herself clear of the cubs and sprang forward. Her eyes like two green moons in the darkness, facing the blazing eyes of Shere Khan. 
and it is I, Raksha, the demon who answers. The man-cub is mine, Lungri, mine to me. He shall not be killed. He shall live to run with the pack and to hunt with the pack, and in the end, look you, hunter of little naked cubs, frog-eater, fish-killer, he shall hunt thee. Now get hence, or by the Samher that I killed, back thou goest to thy mother, burned beast of the jungle, lamer than ever thou camest into the world, go. Father Wolf looked on amazed. He had almost forgotten the days when he won Mother Wolf in a fair fight from five other wolves, when she ran in the pack and was not called the demon for compliment's sake. Shere Khan might have faced Father Wolf, but he could not stand up against Mother Wolf, for he knew that where he was she had all the advantage of the ground and would fight to the death. So he backed out of the cave mouth growling, and when he was clear he shouted, Each dog barks in his own yard. We will see what the pack will say to this fostering of man-cubs. The cub is mine, and to my teeth he will come in the end, O oh, bush-tailed thieves. Mother Wolf threw herself down panting among the cubs, and Father Wolf said to her gravely, Shere Khan speaks this much truth. The cub must be shown to the pack. Will thou still keep him, mother? Keep him, she gasped. He came naked by night, alone, and very hungry, yet he was not afraid. Look, he has pushed one of my babes to one side already, and that lame butcher would have killed him, and would have run off to the Wanganga while the villagers were hunted through all our lairs in revenge. Assuredly I will keep him. Lie still, little frog. Mowgli, for Mowgli the frog I will call thee. The time will come when thou will hunt Shere Khan as he has hunted thee. What will our pack say? said Father Wolf. The law of the jungle lays down very clearly that any wolf may, when he marries, withdraw from the pack he belongs to. But as soon as his cubs are old enough to stand on their feet, he must bring them to the pack council, which is generally held once a month at full moon, in order that the other wolves may identify them. And after that inspection, the cubs are free to run where they please and until they have killed their first buck, no excuse is accepted. If a grown wolf of the pack kills one of them, the punishment is death, where the murderer can be found, and if you think for a minute, you will see that this must be so. Father Wolf waited till his cubs could run a little, and then, on the night of the pack meeting, took them and Mowgli and Mother Wolf to the council rock, a hilltop covered with stones and boulders where a hundred wolves can hide. Kayla, the great grey lone wolf who led all the pack by strength and cunning, lay out at full length on his rock, and below him sat forty or more wolves of every size and colour, from badger-coloured veterans who could handle a buck alone to young black three-year-olds who thought they could. The lone wolf had led them for a year now. He had fallen twice into a wolf trap in his youth, and once he had been beaten and left for dead, so he knew the manners and customs of men. There was very little talking at the rock. The cubs tumbled over each other in the center of the circle where their mothers and fathers sat. And now and again a senior wolf would quietly go up to a cub, look at him carefully, and return to his place on noiseless feet. Sometimes a mother would push her cub far out into the moonlight to be sure that it had not been overlooked. A kayla from his rock would cry, Ye know the law, ye know the law, look well, O wolves and the anxious mothers would take up the call. Look, look well, O oh wolves. At last, Mother Wolf's neck bristles lifted at the same time. Father Wolf pushed Mowgli the frog as they called him into the center where he sat laughing and playing with some pebbles that glistened in the moonlight. Akela never raised his head from his paws, but went on with the monotonous cry. Look well. A muffled roar came up from behind the rock, the voice of Sheer Khan crying. The cub is mine. Give him to me. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Akela never even twitched his ears. All he said was, Look well, O oh wolves. What have the free people to do with the orders of any save the free people? Look well. There was a chorus of deep growls, and a young wolf in his fourth year flung back Shere Khan's question to Akela. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Now, 
The law of the jungle lays down that if there is any dispute as to the right of a cub to be accepted by the pack, he must be spoken for by at least two members of the pack who are not his father and mother. Who speaks for this cub? said Akela. Among the free people, who speaks? There was no answer, and Mother Wolf got ready for what she knew would be her last fight if things came to fighting. Then... The only other creature who is allowed at the pack council, Baloo, the sleepy brown bear who teaches the wolf cubs the lore of the jungle, old Baloo, who can come and go where he pleases because he eats only nuts and roots and honey, rose upon his hind quarters and grunted. The man's cub? The man's cub. I speak for the man's cub. There's no harm in a man's cub. I have no gift of words, but I speak the truth. Let him run with the pack and be entered with the others. I myself will teach him. We need yet another, said Akela. Baloo has spoken, and he is our teacher for the young cubs. Who speaks besides Baloo? A black shadow dropped down into the circle. It was Bagheera, the black panther. Inky black all over, but with the panther markings showing up in certain lights, like the pattern of watered silk. Everybody knew Bagheera, and nobody cared to cross his path for he was as cunning as Tabaki, as bold as the wild buffalo, and as reckless as a wounded elephant. He had a voice as soft as wild honey dripping from a tree, and a skin softer than down. Oh, Akela, and ye the free people, he purred. I have no right in your assembly, but by the law of the jungle, it says that if there is a doubt which is not a killing matter in regard to a new cub, the life of that cub may be bought at a price, and the law does not say who may or may not pay that price. Am I right? Good, good, said the young wolves, who are always hungry. Listen to Bagheera, the cub can be bought for a price, it is the law. Knowing that I have no right to speak here, I ask your leave. Speak then, cried twenty voices. To kill a naked cub is a shame. Besides, he may make better sport for you when he is grown. Baloo has spoken in his behalf, now to Baloo's word I will add one bull, and a fat one newly killed, not half a mile from here, if you will accept a man's cub, according to the law. Is it difficult? There was a clamour of scores of voices, saying, What matter? He will die in winter rains, he will scorch in the sun, what harm can a naked frog do us? Let him run with the pack. Where is the bull, Bagheera? Let him be accepted. And then a Kayla's deep bay, crying, Look well, look well, O wolf. Mowgli was still deeply interested in the pebbles, and he did not notice when the wolves came and looked at him one by one. At last they all went down the hill for the dead bull, and only Akela, Bagheera, Baloo, and Mowgli's own wolves were left. Shere Khan roared still in the night, for he was very angry that Mowgli had not been handed over to him. I roar well, said Bagheera under his whiskers, for the time will come when this naked thing will make thee roar to another tune, or I know nothing of man. It was well done, said Akela. Men and their cubs are very wise. He may be of help in time. Truly, a help in time of need, for none can hope to lead the pack forever, said Bagheera. Akela said nothing. He was thinking of the time that comes to every leader, of every pack, when his strength goes from him and he gets feebler and feebler, till at last he is killed by the wolves, and a new leader comes up to be killed in his turn. Take him away, he said to Father Wolf, and train him as he befits one of the free people. And that is how Mowgli was entered into the C and E wolf pack, for the price of a bull, and on Baloo's good word. Now, you must be content to skip ten or eleven whole years and only guess at all the wonderful life that Mowgli led among the wolves, as if it were written out it would fill ever so many books. He grew up with the cubs, though they of course were grown wolves, almost before he was a child and Father Wolf taught him his business, and the meaning of things in the jungle, till every rustle in the grass, every breath of the warm night air, every note of the owls above his head, every scratch of a bat's claws, as it roosted for a while in a tree, and every splash of every little fish jumping in a pool, meant just as much to him as the work of his office means to a businessman. When he was not learning, he sat out in the sun and slept, and ate and went to sleep again. When he felt dirty or hot, he swam in the forest pools, and when he wanted honey, 
Baloo told him that honey and nuts were just as pleasant to eat as raw meat. He climbed up for it, and that Bagheera showed him how to do. Bagheera would lie out on a branch and call, Come along, little brother. And at first Mowgli would cling like the sloth, but afterwards he would fling himself through the branches almost as boldly as the great ape. He took his place at Council Rock, too, when the pack met. There he discovered that if he stared hard at any wolf, the wolf would be forced to drop his eyes, and so he used to stare for fun. At other times he would pick the long thorns out of the pads of his friends, for wolves suffer terribly from thorns and burrs in their coats. He would go down the hillside into the cultivated lands by night, and look very curiously at the villagers in their huts. But he had a mistrust of men, because Bagheera showed him a square box with a drop gate, so cunningly hidden in the jungle that he nearly walked into it, and told him that it was a trap loved better than anything else to go with Bagheera into the dark, warm heart of the forest, to sleep all through the drowsy day, and at night see how Bagheera did his killing. Bagheera killed right and left as he felt hungry, and so did Mowgli, with one exception. As soon as he was old enough to understand things, Bagheera told him he must never touch cattle, because he had been brought into the pack at the price of a bull's life. All the jungle is thine, said Bagheera, and thou canst kill everything that thou art strong enough to kill, but for the sake of the bull that bought thee thou must never kill or eat any cattle young or old. That is the law of the jungle. Mowgli obeyed faithfully, and he grew and grew strong, as a boy must grow who does not know that he is learning any lessons and there is nothing in the world to think of except things to eat. Mother Wolf told him once or twice that Shere Khan was not a creature to be trusted, and that some day he must kill Shere Khan. But though a young wolf would have remembered that advice every hour, Mowgli forgot it, because he was only a boy. Though he would have called himself a wolf, he had been able to speak in a human tongue. Shere Khan was always crossing his path in the jungle, for as Akela grew older, and feebler the lame tiger had come to be great friends with the younger wolves of the pack, who followed him for scraps. A thing Akela would have never allowed if he had dared to push his authority to the proper bounds. Then Shere Khan would flatter them, and wonder that such fine young hunters were content to be led by a dying wolf and a man-cub. They tell me, Shere Khan would say, that at council ye dare not look him between the eyes and the young wolves would growl and bristle. Bagheera, who had eyes and ears everywhere, knew something of this, and once or twice he told Mowgli in so many words that Shere Khan would kill him some day. Mowgli would laugh and answer, I have the pack and I have thee, and Baloo, though he is so lazy might strike a blow or two for my sake. Why should I be afraid? It was one very warm day that a new notion came to Bagheera, born of something that he had heard. Perhaps Ikki the porcupine had told him, but he said to Mowgli when they were deep in the jungle as the boy lay with his head on Bagheera's beautiful black skin, Little brother, how often have I told thee that Shere Khan is thy enemy? As many times as there are nuts on that palm, said Mowgli, who naturally could not count. What of it? I'm sleepy, Bagheera, and Shere Khan is all long tail and loud talk, like Mao the peacock. But this is no time for sleeping. Baloo knows it, I know it, the pack knows it. And even the foolish, foolish deer know. Tabaki has told thee too. Oh, said Mowgli, Tabaki came to me not long ago with some rude talk that I was a naked man's cub and not fit to dig pine nuts. But I caught Tabaki by the tail and I swung him twice against a palm tree to teach him better manners. That was foolishness. For though Tabaki is a mischief maker, he would have told thee of something that concerned thee closely. Open those eyes, little brother. Shere Khan dare not kill thee in the jungle, but remember, Akela is very old. And soon the day comes when he cannot kill his buck, and he will be leader no more. Many of the wolves that looked thee over when thou wast brought to the council first are old. And the young wolves believe, as Shere Khan has taught them, that a man-cub has no place with the pack. In a little time, thou wilt be a man. 
And what is a man that he should not run with his brothers? said Mowgli. I was born in the jungle. I've obeyed the law of the jungle, and there's no wolf of ours from whose paws I've not pulled a thorn. Surely they are my brothers. Bagheera stretched himself at full length and half shut his eyes. Little brother, feel under my jaw. Mowgli put his strong brown hand under Bagheera's silky chin, where the giant rolling muscles were all hid by glossy hair, and came upon a little bald spot. There is no one in the jungle that knows that I, Bagheera, carry the mark. The mark of the collar. And yet, little brother, I was born among men, and it was among men that my mother died, in the cages of the king's palace, because of this, that I paid the price for thee at the council when thou wast a little naked cub, yes, I too was born among men. I had never seen the jungle. They fed me behind bars from an iron pan, till one night I felt that I was Bagheera the panther, and no man's plaything. And I broke the silly lock with one blow of my paw and came away. And because I had learned the ways of men, I became more terrible in the jungle than Shere Khan, is it not so? Yes, said Mowgli. All the jungle fear Bagheera, all except Mowgli. Oh, thou art a man's cub, said the Black Panther very tenderly. And even as I returned to my jungle, so thou must go back to men at last. To the men who are thy brothers, if thou art not killed in the council. But why? Why should any wish to kill me? said Mowgli. Look at me, said Bagheera. And Mowgli looked at him steadily between the eyes. The big panther turned his head away in half a minute. That is why, he said, shifting his paws on the leaves. Not even I can look thee between the eyes. And I was born among men, and I love thee, little brother. The others, they hate thee because their eyes cannot meet thine, because thou art wise, thou hast pulled out thorns from their feet, because thou art a man. I did not know these things, said Mowgli sullenly, and he frowned under his heavy black eyebrows. What is the law of the jungle? Strike first and then give tongue. By thy very carelessness they know thou art a man. But be wise. It is in my heart that when a Akela misses his next kill, and at each hunt it costs him more to pin the buck, the pack will turn against him and against thee. It will hold a jungle council at the rock. And then, and then, I have it, said Bagheera, leaping up. Go thou down quickly to the men's huts in the valley and take some of the red flower which they grow there, so that when the time comes thou mayest even have a stronger friend than I or Baloo, or those of the pack that love thee, get the red flower. By red flower, Bagheera meant fire. Only no creature in the jungle will call fire by its proper name. Every beast lives in deadly fear of it, and invents a hundred ways of describing it. The red flower, said Mowgli, that grows outside their huts in the twilight, I will get some. There speaks the man's cub, said Bagheera proudly. Remember that it grows in little pots. Get one swiftly and keep it by thee for the time of need. Good, said Mowgli. I go. But art thou sure? Oh, my Bagheera. He slipped his arm around the splendid neck and looked deep into the big eyes. Art thou sure this is all Shere Khan's doing? By the broken lock that freed me, I am sure, little brother. Then, by the bull that bought me, I will pay Shere Khan full tale for this. And it may be a little over, said Mowgli, and he bounded away. Mowgli was far and far through the forest, running hard, and his heart was hot in him. He came to the cave as the evening mist rose, and drew breath, and looked down the valley. The cubs were out, but Mother Wolf at the back of the cave knew by his breathing that something was troubling her frog. What is it, son, she said. Some that chatter of sheer Khan, he called back. I hunt among the ploughed fields tonight. He plunged downward through the bushes to the stream at the bottom of the valley. There he checked, for he heard the yell of the pack hunting. Heard the bellow of a hunted samba, the snort as the buck turned at bay. Then there were wicked, bitter howls from the young wolves. 
Let the lone wolf show his strength. Room for the leader of the pack. Spring, Akla. The lone wolf must have sprung and missed his hold, for Mowgli heard the snap of his teeth, and then a yelp as the Samba knocked him over with his forefoot. He did not wait for anything more but dashed on, and the yells grew fainter behind him as he ran into the croplands where the villagers lived. Bagheera spoke the truth, he panted, as he nestled down in some cattle fodder by the window of a hut. Tomorrow is one day both, for Akla and for me. He pressed his face close to the window and watched the fire on the hearth. He saw the husbandman's wife get up and feed it in the night with black lumps. When the morning came and the mists all white and cold, he saw the man's child pick up a wicker pot plastered inside with earth fill it with lumps of red-hot charcoal, put it under his blanket, and go out to tend the cows in the byre. Is that all? said Mowgli. If a cub can do it, then there is nothing to fear. He strode around the corner and met the boy, took the pot from his hand, and disappeared into the mist, while the boy howled with fear. They're very like me, said Mowgli, blowing into the pot as he had seen the woman do. This thing will die if I do not give it things to eat. He dropped twigs and dried bark on the red stuff. Halfway up the hill he met Bagheera, with the morning dew shining like moonstones on his coat. Akala has missed, said the panther. They would have killed him last night, but needed thee also. They were looking for thee on the hill. I was among the ploughed lands. I'm ready, see? Mowgli held up the fire pot. Good. Now, I have seen men thrust a dry branch into that stuff, and presently the red flower blossomed at the end of it. Art thou not afraid? No. Why should I fear? I remember now, if it's not a dream, how, before I was a wolf, I lay beside the red flower, and it was warm and pleasant. All that day, Mowgli sat in the cave, tending his fire pot, dipping dry branches into it to see how they looked. He found a branch that satisfied him, and in the evening, when Tabaki came to the cave and told him rudely enough that he was wanted at Council Rock, he laughed until Tabaki ran away. Then Mowgli went to the council, still laughing. Akala, the lone wolf, lay by the side of his rock as a sign that the leadership of the pack was open, and Shere Khan, with his following of scrap-fed wolves, walked to and fro, openly being flattered. Bagheera lay close to Mowgli. The fire pot was between Mowgli's knees. When they were all gathered together, Shere Khan began to speak, a thing he would never have dared to do when Akla was in his prime. He has no right, whispered Bagheera. Say so, he is a dog's son. He will be frightened. Mowgli sprang to his feet. Free people, he cried. Does Shere Khan lead the pack? What has a tiger to do with our leadership? Seeing that the leadership is yet open, and being asked to speak, Shere Khan began. By whom? said Mowgli. Are we all jackals to fawn on this cattle butcher? The leadership of the pack is with the pack alone. There were yells of silence, thou man's cub. Let him speak, he has kept our law. And at last the seniors of the pack thundered. Let the dead wolf speak. When a leader of the pack has missed his kill, he's called dead wolf for as long as he lives, which is not long. Akala raised his old head wearily. Free people, and ye two jackals of Shere Khan, for twelve seasons I have led ye to and from the kill. In all that time not one has been trapped or maimed. Now I have missed my kill. You know how that plot was made. You know how you brought me up to an untried buck to make my weakness known. It was cleverly done. Your right is to kill me here on the Council Rock now. Therefore I ask who comes to make an end of the Lone Wolf. For it is my right by the law of the jungle that ye come one by one. There was a long hush for no single wolf cared to fight Akala to the death. Shere Khan roared. What have we to do with this toothless fool? He is doomed to die. 
It is the man-cub who has lived too long. Free people, he was my meat from the first. Give him to me. I am weary of this man-wolf folly. He has troubled the jungle for ten seasons. Give me the man-cub, or I will hunt here always and not give you one bone. He is a man, a man's child, and from the marrow of my bones I hate him. Then more than half of the pack yelled, A man, a man. What is a man to do with us? Let him go to his own place. And turn all the people of the villages against us, clamored Shere Khan. No. Give him to me. He is a man, and none of us can look him between the eyes. Akala lifted his head again and said, He has eaten our food. He has slept with us. He has driven game for us. He has broken no word of the law of the jungle. Also, I paid for him with a bull when he was accepted. The worth of a bull is little, but Bagheera's honor is something that he will perhaps fight for, said Bagheera in his gentlest voice. A bull paid ten years ago, the pack snarled. What do we care for bones that are ten years old? Or for a pledge, said Bagheera, his white teeth bared under his lip. Well, are ye called the free people? No man's cub can run with the people of the jungle, howled Shere Khan. Give him to me. He is our brother in all but blood, Akala went on. And ye would kill him here. In truth, I have lived too long. Some of ye are eaters of cattle, and of others I have heard that, under Shere Khan's teaching... You go by dark night and snatch children from the villager's doorstep. Therefore, I know ye to be cowards, and it is to cowards that I speak. It is certain that I must die, and my life is of no worth, or I would offer it in the man-cub's place. But for the sake of the honor of the pack, a little matter that by being without a leader ye have forgotten, I promise that if ye can let the man-cub go to his own place, I will not, when my time comes to die, bear one tooth against you. I will die without fighting. That will at least save the pack three lives. More I cannot do, but if ye will, I can save you the shame that comes of killing a brother, against whom there is no fault. A brother spoken for, and bought into the pack, according to the law of the jungle. He is a man, a man, snarled the pack. Most of the walls began to gather round Shere Khan, whose tail was beginning to switch. Now the business is in thy hands, said Bagheera to Mowgli. We can do no more, except fight. Mowgli stood upright, the fire pot in his hands. He stretched out his arms and yawned in the face of the council. But he was furious with rage and sorrow for wolf-like. The wolves had never told him how they hated him. Listen, you, he cried. There is no need for this dog's jabber. Ye have told me so often tonight that I am a man, and I would have been a wolf with you to my life's end, that I feel your words are true. So I do not call you my brothers any more. But dogs, as a man should... What ye will do and what ye will not do is not yours to say. That matter is with me. That we may see the matter more plainly, I, the man, have brought here a little of the red flower which ye dogs fear. He flung the fire pot on the ground and some of the red coals lit a tuft of dried moss that flared up. All the council drew back in terror before leaping flames. Mowgli thrust his dead branch into the fire till the twigs lit and crackled. He whirled it above his head, among cowering wolves. Thou art the master, said Bagheera in an undertone. Save Akala from the death, he was ever thy friend. Akala, the grim old wolf who had never asked for mercy in his life, gave one piteous look at Mowgli. The boy stood naked, his long black hair tossing over his shoulder in the light of the blazing branch that made the shadows jump and quiver. 
Good, said Mowgli, staring around slowly. I see that ye are dogs. I go from you to my own people, if they be my own people. The jungle is shut to me, and I must forget your talk and your companionship. But I will be more merciful than ye are, because I was all but your brother in blood. I promise that when I am a man among men, I will not betray ye to men, as ye have betrayed me. He kicked the fire with his foot and sparks flew up. There shall be no war between any of us in the pack, but here is a debt to pay before I go. He strode forward to where Shere Khan sat blinking stupidly at the flames, caught him by the tuft on his chin. Bagheera followed in case of accidents. Up, dog, Mowgli cried. Up when a man speaks, or I will set that coat ablaze. Shere Khan's ears lay flat back on his head. He shut his eyes, for the blazing branch was very near. This cattle killer said he would kill me in the council because he had not killed me when I was a cub. Thus and thus, then, do we beat dogs when we are men, stir a whisker lungry, and I ram the red flower down thy gullet. He beat Shere Khan over the head with the branch. The tiger whimpered and whined in agony of fear. Singed jungle cat, go now, remember, when next I come to Council Rock as a man should come, it will be with Shere Khan's hide on my head. For the rest, Akala goes free to live as he pleases. You will not kill him. That is not my will. Nor do I think that you will sit here any longer, lolling out your tongues as though you were somebody's, instead of dogs whom I drive out. Go. The fire was burning furiously at the end of the branch. Ogly struck right and left around the circle, and the wolves ran howling with the sparks burning their fur. At last there were only Akla, Bagheera, and perhaps ten wolves that had taken Mowgli's part. Something began to hurt Mowgli inside him, as he had never been hurt in his life before. He caught his breath and he sobbed and tears ran down his face. What is it? What is it? He said, I, I do not wish to leave the jungle, and I do not know what this is. Am I dying, Bagheera? No, little brother, that is only tears such as men use, said Bagheera. Now I know thou art a man, and a man's cub no longer. The jungle is shut indeed to thee henceforward. Let them fall, Mowgli, they are only tears. So Mowgli sat and cried as though his heart would break, and he had never cried in all of his life before. Now, he said, I will go to men, but first I must say farewell to my mother. He went to the cave where she lived with Father Wolf. He cried on her coat, while the four cubs howled miserably. You will not forget me, said Mowgli. Never while we can follow a trail, said the cubs. Come to the foot of the hill when thou art a man. We will talk to thee. We will come into the croplands to play with thee by night. Come soon, said Father Wolf. Wise little frog, come again soon, for we be old, Mother and I. Come soon, said Mother Wolf, little naked son of mine. But listen, child of man, I loved thee more than I ever loved my cubs. I will surely come, said Mowgli. And when I come, it will be to lay out Shere Khan's hide upon Council Rock. Do not forget me. Tell them in the jungle never to forget me. Dawn was beginning to break when Mowgli went down the hillside alone to meet those mysterious things that are called men. Kaa's hunting. His spots are the joy of the leopard. His horns are the buffalo's pride. He clean for the strength of the hunter is known by the gloss of his hide. If ye can find the bullock can toss you or the heavy-browed samba can gore, ye need not stop work to inform us. We knew it ten seasons before. Oppress not the cubs of the stranger, 
but hail them as sister and brother. For though they are little and fubsy, it may be the bear is their mother. There is none like to me, says the cub in the pride of his earliest kill. But the jungle is large, the cub he is small. Let him think and be still. The Maxims of Baloo All that is told here happened some time before Mowgli was turned out by the wolf pack, or avenged himself on Shere Khan the tiger. It was in the days when Baloo was teaching him the lore of the jungle. The big, serious old brown bear was delighted to have so quick a pupil. For the young wolves will only learn as much of the lore of the jungle as applies to their own pack and tribe, and run away as soon as they can repeat the hunting verse. Feet that make no noise, eyes that can see in the dark, ears that can hear the winds in their lairs and sharp white teeth. All these things are the marks of our brothers except Tabaki the jackal and the hyena, whom we hate. But Mowgli, as a man-cub, had to learn a great deal more than this. Sometimes Bagheera the Black Panther would come lounging through the jungle to see how his pet was getting on. He would purr with his head against a tree whilst Mowgli recited the day's lesson to Baloo. The boy could climb almost as well as he could swim, and swim almost as well as he could run. So Baloo, the teacher of the law, taught him the wood and the water laws, how to tell a rotten branch from a sound one, how to speak politely to the wild bees when he came upon a hive of them fifty feet above ground. What to say to Mang the bat when he disturbed him in the branches at midday. And how to warn the water snakes in the pool before he splashed down among them. None of the jungle people like being disturbed, and are all very ready to fly at an intruder. Then too Mowgli was taught the stranger's hunting call, which must be repeated aloud till it is answered. Whenever one of the jungle people hunts outside his own grounds, it means translated, Give me leave to hunt here, as I am hungry. The answer is hunt for food, but not for pleasure. This will show you how much Mowgli had to learn by heart, and he grew very tired of saying the same thing over a hundred times. But as Baloo said to Bagheera one day when Mowgli had been cuffed and run off in a temper, a man's cub is a man's cub, and he must learn all the lore of the jungle. But think how small he is, said the Black Panther, who would have spoiled Mowgli if he had had his own way. How can his little head carry all thy long talk? Is there anything in the jungle too little to be killed? No. That's why I teach him these things. That is why I hit him, very softly, when he forgets. Softly? What dost thou know of softness, old iron feet? Bagheera grunted. His face is all bruised today by thy softness. Ugh. Better he should be bruised from head to foot by me who love him than that he should come to harm through ignorance, Blue answered very earnestly. I am now teaching him the master words of the jungle that shall protect him with the birds and the snake people and all that hunt on four feet except his own pack. He can now claim protection if he will only remember the words from all in the jungle. Is not that worth a little beating? Well, look to it then, and thou dost not kill the man-cub. He is no tree-trunk to sharpen thy blunt claws upon. But what are those master words? I'm more likely to give help than to ask for it. Bagheera stretched out one paw, and admired the steel-blue ripping chisel talons at the end of it. Still, I should like to know. I will call Mowgli, and he shall say them, if he will. Come, little brother. My head is ringing like a bee tree, said a sullen little voice over their heads. Mowgli slid down a tree trunk, very angry and indignant, adding as he reached the ground, I come for Bagheera, and not for thee, fat old Baloo. That is all one to me, said Baloo, though he was hurt and grieved. Tell Bagheera, then, the master words of the jungle that I taught thee this day. Master words for which people, said Mowgli, delighted to show off. The jungle has many tongues, I, I know them all. A little thou knowest, but not much, see? O Bagheera, they never thank their teacher. 
Not one small wolfling has ever come back to thank old Baloo for his teachings. Say the word for the hunting people, then, great scholar. We be of one blood, ye and I, said Mowgli, giving the words the bare accent which all the hunting people use. Good. Now for the birds, Mowgli repeated, with the kite's whistle at the end of each sentence. Now, the snake people, said Bagheera. The answer was a perfectly indescribable hiss, and Mowgli kicked up his feet behind, clapped his hands together to applaud for himself, and jumped onto Bagheera's back, where he sat sideways, drumming his heels on the glossy skin, making the worst faces that he could think of at Baloo. There, there, that was worth a little bruise, said the brown bear tenderly. Some day thou wilt remember me. Then he turned aside to tell Bagheera how he had begged the master words from Hathi the wild elephant, who knows all about all these things, and how Hathi had taken Mowgli down to the pool to get the snake word from a water snake, because Baloo could not pronounce it, and how Mowgli was now reasonably safe against all accidents in the jungle, because neither snake, bird, nor beast would hurt him. No one then is to be feared, Baloo wound up, patting his big furry stomach with pride. Except his own tribe, said Bagheera under his breath, and then aloud to Mowgli to have care for my ribs, little brother. What is all this dancing up and down? Mowgli had been trying to make himself heard by pulling at Bagheera's shoulder fur and kicking hard. When the two listened to him, he was shouting at the top of his voice. And so I shall have a tribe of my own, and lead them through the branches all day long. What is this new folly, little dreamer of dreams, said Bagheera. Yes, and throw branches and dirt at old Baloo, Mowgli went on. They've promised me this. Baloo's big paw scooped Mowgli off of Bagheera's back. And as the boy lay between the big four paws, he could see the bear was angry. Mowgli, said Baloo, thou hast been talking with the Bandalog, the monkey people. Mowgli looked at Bagheera to see if the panther was angry too, and Bagheera's eyes were as hard as jade stones. Thou hast been with the monkey people? The grey apes, the people without a law, the eaters of anything. That is great shame. When Baloo hurt my head, said Mowgli as he was still on his back, I went away, and the grey apes came down from the trees and they had pity on me. No one else cared, he snuffled a little. The pity of the monkey people, Baloo snorted, the stillness of the mountain stream, the cool of the summer sun, and then man cub, and then, and then they gave me nuts and pleasant things to eat. They carried me in their arms to the top of the trees, and they said I was their blood brother, except that I had no tail, and should be their leader some day. They have no leader, said Bagheera. They lie, they have always lied. They were very kind. They bade me come again. Why have I never been taken among the monkey people? They, they stand on their feet as I do. They do not hit me with their hard paws. They play all day. Let me get up. Bad Baloo, let me up. I will play with them again. Listen, man-cub, said the bear. His voice rumbled like thunder on a hot night. I have taught thee all the law of the jungle for all the peoples of the jungle except the monkey folk who live in the trees. They have no law. They are outcasts. They have no speech of their own, but they use the stolen words which they overhear when they listen and peep and wait up above in the branches. Their way is not our way. They are without leaders. They have no remembrance. They boast and chatter and pretend that they are a great people, about to do great affairs in the jungle. But the falling of a nut turns their minds to laughter, and all is forgotten. We of the jungle have no dealings with them. We do not drink where the monkeys drink. We do not go where the monkeys go. We do not hunt where they hunt. We do not die where they die. Hast thou ever heard me speak of the Bandalog till today? No, said Mowgli in a whisper. The forest was very still now Baloo had finished. The jungle people put them out of their mouths and out of their minds. They're very many, evil, dirty, shameless, and they desire, if they have any fixed desire, to be noticed by the jungle people. But we do not notice them. 
even when they throw nuts and filth on our heads. He had hardly spoken when a shower of nuts and twigs spattered down through the branches, and they could hear coughing and howling and angry jumping high up in the air among the thin branches. The monkey people are forbidden, said Baloo. Forbidden to the jungle people, remember? Forbidden, said Bagheera. But I still think Baloo should have warned thee against them. I, how was I to guess that he would play with such dirt? The monkey people. <laughs> A fresh shower came down on their heads, and the two trotted away, taking Mowgli with them. What Baloo had said about the monkeys was perfectly true. They belonged to the treetops. And as beasts very seldom look up, there was no occasion for the monkeys and the jungle people to cross each other's path. But whenever they found a sick wolf, or a wounded tiger or bear, the monkeys would torment him. They would throw sticks and nuts at any beast for fun, in the hope of being noticed. Then they would howl and shriek their senseless songs, and invite the jungle people to climb up the tree and fight them, or start a furious battle over nothing among themselves and leave dead monkeys where jungle people could see them. They were always going to just have a leader and laws and customs of their own, but they never did. Their memories would not hold over from day to day, and so they compromised things by making up a saying. What the Bandalog think now, the jungle will think later. That comforted them a great deal. None of the beasts could reach them, but on the other hand, none of the beasts would notice them and that was why they were so pleased when Mowgli came to play. And they heard how angry Blue was. And that is where we close the book on tonight's episode of Down to Sleep and on the Jungle Book. <laughs>